While Bohr and de Broglie managed to describe the hydrogen atom, Schrodinger's equation was able to describe hydrogen with the same detail. And then, it could go far beyond. It manages to account not only for the hydrogen atom, but it describes nothing less than all the atoms and all the elements in the universe. Schrodinger's quantum mechanics explains every element in the periodic table of the elements. The solution to Schrodinger's equation, called the wave function, is a fantastically accurate description of the real world. Werner Heisenberg did more than make a quantitative statement when he said that the particle's position and momentum could not be known simultaneously. He wrote an equation that quantified the relationship. Let's see how that information can lead to an easy understanding of the hydrogen atom described in exquisite detail by the Schrodinger equation. Without going into too much detail, let's look at a proton and an electron. Since the electron has a very tiny mass, it can occupy a very large region of space. Conversely, the proton has a very large mass, 2,000 times that of an electron. And therefore, it occupies a very tiny region of space. The result is a quantum mechanical hydrogen atom. A tiny mass of nucleus surrounded by a much larger cloud representing the electron. If we look at a simple graph relating the probability of finding the electron in a shell at a given distance from the nucleus, we find that as we travel outward from the nucleus, the probability increases at first as the shell expands. It reaches a maximum value and then decreases again as the electron cloud thins to almost nothing at large distances. Amazingly, the radius where the probability reaches a maximum is precisely equal to the radius of the first allowed orbit of Niels Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. And its energy is exactly equal to the energy of an electron in this orbit in the Bohr atom. So this is a very good picture of a hydrogen atom with an electron in the lowest energy state. The electron occupies a cloud instead of an orbit. But it spends most of its time at the radius predicted as an orbit by the Bohr model. It also spends most of its time possessing the energy that an electron in that orbit would have. But of course the atom is not always found in the lowest energy state. As there are other orbits allowed in Bohr's model, there are other higher energy states in the quantum mechanical hydrogen atom. These states are defined primarily by the quantum number, n, that we talked about earlier. And for each state, the electron has a different energy, which results from the shape of the electron cloud. For n equals 1, called the ground state, the shape is a symmetric cloud, the same in all directions. For n equals 2, the shape can take two forms, although both shapes have the same energy. One is a double spherical cloud, one sphere inside the other, while the other shape for n equals 2 is in the shape of a dumbbell. For other values of n, the shapes can be pretty strange. Like this torus, plus dumbbell shape.
An electron in the lowest energy shell in an atom can be struck by and absorb the energy of a photon, giving it enough energy to jump to the next energy shell. And the reverse process allows the electron to jump back down into the lowest energy shell and emit a photon. The color of the photon depends on the energy difference between the two shells. This explains the spectral lines that identify an element. Since white light contains all the colors in the spectrum, when we shine white light on a sample of an element under the right conditions, the atoms absorb all the photons that allow their electrons to jump to other energy shells. So, the absorption spectrum is all the colors in white light minus those that match the difference in energy shells within the atom. And when those electrons spontaneously jump back down to the lowest energy levels, that emission spectrum contains only the lines that match the difference in the energy shells within the atom. We have just discussed how Schrodinger's equation shows us how to accurately describe fundamental particles with a wave function. Now let's examine why two electrons together reveal a feature of quantum mechanics totally unlike anything in the large-scale world we inhabit. In a classical setting, even if two things are identical, they are still individuals. As long as we keep track of them carefully, we can treat them separately and label them A and B, or X and Y, or 1 and 2. But consider what is different about a two-electron system. Whether in an atom or in a box, it doesn't matter. Since the two electrons are consistently phasing in and out of existence, and since they are absolutely identical, it is impossible to keep track of specific individuals. Because of this, we must use a combined wave function to describe the pair rather than using two individual wave functions. This new two-particle wave function will have two parts to it. And those parts will either add or subtract. Physicists would say this makes the wave function either symmetric or antisymmetric. And it turns out that only the antisymmetric function works for the electrons, and quarks, and protons, and neutrons. Let's let this red wave represent the first part of the combined wave function, and this green wave represent the negative of the second part. If the electrons are in the same state, these two waves will be a mirror image of one another. As one goes up, the other goes down in perfect synchrony. So when we combine them, we get no wave at all. And since the wave is a map of electrons existing at that point, no wave means no electrons. So clearly, two electrons can never be in the same state because that causes their combined wave function to disappear.